Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the Buckley and GPS webinar to discuss the HVAC system's role in improving indoor air quality. My name is Dean Lees, and I'm a member of the engineering and marketing team here at Buckley Associates. Joining us today uh, and our main speaker is uh, David Churik of uh, GPS. Also here uh, on the line is Larry Botello. Uh, VP of Regional Sales for the Northeast Region. Uh, before handing things over to Dave, I'd like to say a few words regarding the partnership with Buckley and GPS. Uh, this is a relatively new relationship for us, but we're very excited about it. Some of you may have seen that Buckley has partnered with GPS uh, for, um, uh, for the Northeast to enable us to provide needle point bipolar ionization solutions. This is a very exciting relationship for us here at Buckley and I'm proud to represent GPS. They're, they're a great company and they're really a market leader in this space. Uh, I was recently able to tour their facility down in Charlotte and it was quite impressive. Uh, every product they bring to market starts out right with research and development. And you know this research and development came long before the, the recent pandemic that we're in now. And uh, these guys really care about bringing a product to market the right way. And they, they care about doing, uh, doing right by the customer and uh, making sure that their product functions the way that they say it does. And the way that they do that is through the testing and really distingu distinguishing themselves as a market leader by pushing for new testing standards through ASHRAE, uh, pushing for standards through UL and, and making sure that you know all manufacturers are held to the same standard and really are brought up to the standard that GPS is manufacturing at. Um, you know, a, a few other things before I hand it over to Dave, uh, administrative items. There are quite a few people on the line today. Um, we had over a hundred register for this session today. So everyone will remain muted throughout the duration of the session. Um, but if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask them. Uh, GoToWebinar has a question function. You can post your questions there. Uh, Larry and myself will be on throughout the duration of the webinar and we'll be monitoring those questions. Uh, we may interrupt Dave uh, throughout the presentation to answer those and address them as they come up. Um, if we don't do that, we'll, we'll address the question at the end. So if you do ask a question um, or if you do have a question, please uh, type it into that question uh, box and we will answer it. At the end of the day, we're really here for you and I, I would like you to get the most out of this that you can. With that, I think I'll hand things over to Dave and let him get going. Thank you very much, Dean. Dean, I can tell you've done this before. That was that was you're hired. <laughs> that was a <laughs> phenomenal introduction. I'm taking you with me everywhere I go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I am thrilled to be here today with Buckley and Associates and everyone online. I understand we do have a packed house. I love that. Um, we are very excited about the relationship, as Dean mentioned. Um, not only in, in, in forging that relationship with Buckley, but as well as with you online here, uh, their individual customers. I'm a rather casual presenter, so I'm, I'm very easy. If, if, if you want to interrupt at any time with questions, Dean or, or Larry, please feel free to do that. I love questions. Um, for me, that I've, I've done this presentation a lot, and for me, the, the, the most fun is, is always at the end or somewhere in between where I get a question maybe I've never heard before, or just questions in general. It just keeps it keeps it kind of exciting and keeps things going. Now, I'm not a great um, uh, presenter on this particular platform, so bear with me while I figure out how to bring a, here we go, look at me. Ah, shoot, that's not what I want. Okay, hold on. What I'm going to do is something I don't normally do, uh, and that is to start my presentation with a video. And the only reason I'm going to start it with a video is simply because I'm going to be trying to explain something to you that you cannot see. You cannot hear, you cannot feel, you cannot touch. Now we can count it and we can measure its impact on the environment. All of that can be done, and I'll talk about that, I promise. But, but, but 
from a conceptual perspective, I want you to actually be able to visualize what it is I'm going to be relaying to you today. So we have put together kind of the Pixar version of ionization. Um, it is It will show you graphically what an ion might look like if you could see it and how it might be transmitted through ductwork and into the space if you could see it. And it's kind of cool. And I think it'll set the conversation up quite readily moving forward. It's only a little bit over two minutes. Um, it's a little bit markety. I try to keep these presentations more technical in nature. It's not that markety or glitzy. I think it'll serve its purpose. And with no further ado, if you don't hear it, I'm assuming you see my screen. If you don't hear it, let me know right away. Have you ever heard someone say, Let's go inside to get some fresh air. Probably not, and it's for good reason. On average, we spend 90% of our time indoors. But according to the EPA, indoor air is often two to five times more polluted than outdoor air. In fact, many of the buildings we occupy could have poor indoor air quality without us ever knowing. Hidden pollutants, off-gassing from chemicals or furniture, and even people are just a few of the sources that degrade indoor air quality. So it's no wonder we go outside for fresh air. Outdoors, naturally occurring ions are everywhere, and they are continuously working to help clean the air. Ions are created with energy from rushing water, crashing waves, and even sunlight. However, the concentration of these naturally occurring ions is much lower indoors, where particles are often suspended in the air. These particles can include dust, dander, smoke, and even viruses and bacteria. There's good news for those who desire to improve indoor air quality, though, thanks to ionization. Our patented new bipolar ionization technology introduces ions into the airstream using the airflow in your existing HVAC system as the delivery method. Ionization can be used in conjunction with ventilation and filtration to further reduce particles and help clean the air in indoor spaces. When ions disperse throughout a space, such as an office or a schoolroom, they combine with particles suspended in the air. This creates a snowball effect in which particles of opposite polarity begin to cluster together. As these larger clusters pass back through the HVAC return, they're easier to capture in the filtration system. Our technology is also effective at reducing certain viruses and bacteria. Tests in third-party laboratories have demonstrated that certain viruses and bacteria are substantially reduced when they come in contact with ions. Other common indoor air pollutants include VOCs, or volatile organic compounds. There are hundreds of types of VOCs that are created by common household items, such as cleaning chemicals. Ionization can also be effective at reducing certain VOCs and odors, like those lingering around nearby trash. You can also feel confident knowing that our ionization technology will not introduce harmful levels of ozone into the air you breathe. Today, our technology is trusted to help clean the air in hundreds of thousands of installations, including offices, schools, airports, healthcare facilities, and other community spaces around the world. I trust everyone could see and hear that, and I certainly appreciate you indulging me for that couple of minutes. Let's get back on track. Can you see my cover screen and can you hear me all right? Someone can verbally give me a yes, I'll, I'll move yes. forward. Perfect, yep. thank you. Yeah. All right, so I wanna start the presentation with this slide. <clears throat> and, and simply because what I'm going to be talking about today is what I call balancing the HVAC system approach. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, we know that the, the cornerstone of, of any good HVAC system begins with, in the upper left-hand corner, if you will, ventilation, right? The amount of outdoor air, hopefully fresh outdoor air that I bring into a space to help dilute the pollutants of concern within the space. And as well, ventilation can include the number of air exchanges that I provide to that space so that I flush the space of those contaminants. And then we go down to the lower left-hand corner and we see filtration, the MERV efficiency of the filter that I install in the HVAC system to extract from the air the contaminants of concern based on their size is very important as well. Ventilation and filtration is the backbone of any good HVAC system, hands down. But let's move up to the upper right-hand corner for a second. Let's talk about relative humidity. 
there's been a lot of talk of late with regards to that sweet spot between 40, 40, and 60, 60 percent relative humidity indoors. It has been said and proposed and studied and proven that humidities indoors within that range are the best for us human beings from a standpoint of our physiological well-being, how we respond in the environment and how the the, the, the environment induces our, our health and well-being, but as well, there's been a lot of study in the past and some study of late with regards to that sweet spot of 40 to 60 percent having an impact, a negative impact, on certain viruses and contaminants and concern indoors. It seems to be the best spot for us as human beings and the worst spot for certain viruses. We don't know yet SARS-CoV-2 specifically, but others have been proven to flourish less within that window than they would outside of the realms of that 40 to 60%. So that may be important as well. And then in the lower right-hand corner, I have what I'm calling advanced IAQ technologies that can be added to make any of those that I just talked about singularly or combined better to increase the effectiveness of ventilation, filtration, and relative humidity to make a system that balances the HVAC system approach, and one that I say may help contribute to indoor social distancing. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, right now within buildings other than hospitals, what we have done up to this point to kind of social distance people that may be ill from those indoors that hopefully aren't, is when you walk up to the front door, you may be asked, are you sick? Do you feel sick? Have you been around anyone that's sick? How are you doing today? The answer may be yes. You, you, you may very well be perfectly well, or you may be asymptomatic and just not know you're ill, but regardless, you may get into the building. So from that point, what we have been asked to do up until late is to wear masks indoors, a good tight fitting mask, and maintain physical social distancing between one another. Now we can do that by limiting the number of chairs in a space. Every other chair is occupied. We can limit the number of people that we allow in the building to kind of create a, a uh, false uh, balance of occupancy inside to limit social distancing. We can do all those types of things. Um, and as well, we may go around and follow people around cleaning and wiping off surfaces to try to mitigate any issues with, you know, touch contamination. From a standpoint of what we're doing indoors right now to social distance people, that's about all we can physically do, you know. When it comes to the air, we cannot run around with a butterfly net and scoop all the bad stuff out of the air. And really, other than what we're doing physically right now in the space, there isn't a whole lot else we can do other than rely on systems that perhaps can help treat issues, contaminants, pollutants of concern in the air to help mitigate our, th their transmission and to help limit our exposure to those elements in the air itself. And to do that, we have to provide some type of an advanced indoor air quality solution that will enhance ventilation, filtration, relative humidity to make that system more balanced and more effective at doing what it is it needs to do. And that is exactly what I'm going to talk about in the next few slides moving forward. Now I'll draw your attention to the upper left-hand side of this particular screen and you'll see a young lady sitting in a room holding her hand up in a sunbeam of light that's coming into the window. And she's looking at all the stuff in the air that she never realized was there. And she's kind of amazed and a little bit surprised and a little bit concerned that she's breathing all that stuff considering this is the first time she's ever seen it. And when you stop and realize that everything in the air is a particle, everything in the air is a particle, it becomes even more concerning. Viruses, most certainly SARS-CoV-2 and others, bacteria, fungus, volatile organic compounds, odors, chemicals, smoke, products of combustion, all kinds of things are in the air that we are breathing both inside and outside. And the scary thing is simply this, what she is seeing is just the tip of the iceberg. She's seeing the stuff that's large enough to be exposed when it's illuminated, but 98% of all the stuff in the air that's a particle of some type, one, of, one or another, is much, much smaller than what you can see when you illuminate it and actually smaller than what you can count when you walk into the room with a traditional handheld particle counter that starts counting at about 0 0.5 microns or thereabouts. Some 98% of it is even smaller. So small you can't see it, so small you can't count it, 
but it most certainly is there. In fact, in a typical cubic foot of indoor environmental air, whether it be a school or an office or a hotel or whatever it might be, there can be 18 to 20 million particles or more per cubic feet. And when you stop and consider that we breathe between three and 400 cubic feet of air every day, it becomes very concerning. So at the end of the day, what it is we really want to do if we're going to have an impact on the indoor air quality within buildings is to do what I call clearing the sunbeam. We need to get the stuff out of the air, the stuff you can see, the stuff you can't see, the stuff you can count, and the stuff you can't count. Because everything in the air is a particle, and most of it shouldn't be there. And if we clean the sunbeam and get the particles out of the air and we can't breathe them, they can't hurt us. And it's a very simple concept. And it's one that we've, we have employed for decades in clean room design. I'll talk more about that in a slide or two. Now, I'll point your attention to the right-hand side of this slide. This is an article I read in the American Journal of Infection Control several years ago. And it was really interesting. It's talking about particle control in a hospital operating room using HEPA filtration. And typically we think of hospital operating rooms as being really clean environments. And they are really clean compared to perhaps what you're seeing in the sunbeam in the picture on the left, but they may not be as clean as we might think they are. In fact, they are not. And what these scientists studied and talked about in this article was the fact that the majority of airborne pathogens in the air, the viruses and bacteria and fungus and things like that, as well as a lot of the other particles, fall into what's called the fine or ultra fine particle ranges. Those are the ones that are so small you can't see them, so small you can't count them with your traditional handheld particle counter. And they tell us in this study that it's a common misconception that these small particles can be effectively cleared from a space, even a hospital operating room, even using HEPA filtration, which is 99.97% efficient. They tell us that unfortunately, most of the very small particles and pathogens and everything else are of insufficient mass, size, and weight to be controlled by what they call bulk airflow. That just means air movement and can remain suspended for days or even weeks. And what they concluded in this article was basically this, it doesn't matter how efficient the filter is that you install, if you can't get the particles from the air back to the filter, it can't be effective. You may have a 100% efficient filter, but if you can't get the particles back to the filter to make it, to, to allow the filter to extract them from the airstream, it's not effective. And there's a big disconnect between efficiency and effectiveness of what we're doing in cleaning the indoor air today not only in office buildings and schools and nursing homes and hospitals, but operating rooms as well. That started leading us down a path over the last 18 months or so. And I'm going to take you down that path right now and give you some information you may not have seen or you may have seen it and just not really taken it to heart. And, and what we are learning through... For example, ASHRAE, the American Society of, of uh, Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, is simply that um, there's, a, there's a lack of evidence that the transmission of SARS-CoV-2 is being, SARS-CoV-2 is being transmitted through HVAC systems. And in fact, uh, in November of 2020, there was an article, uh, an, an interview printed with the Environmental Task Force for ASHRAE that talked exactly about that. And he said specifically, there is not, an, not evidence that SARS-CoV-2 is being transmitted within or through HVAC systems from one space to the other, although air movement within a space can be a factor with regards to transmission. And then in January of 2021, another peer-reviewed ASHRAE article came out in that magazine called Preparing HVAC Systems Before Reoccupying a Building. And the authors talked about the growing science around far-field aerosol transmission. That's similar to what the study I showed you by the doctors uh, in, the, in the previous slide. They said that the growing transmission around far-field aerosol, aerosols essentially negates the need for induct or air system control technologies such as UVC lights. Why? Because the issues of concern appear to be originating in the space with SARS-CoV-2 and remaining in the space and not being transmitted elsewhere. It's transmitting within the space itself from an infected individual 
to a susceptible host. Now, on one hand, that's good information, right? It's good to know that because we, we aren't necessarily overly concerned with SARS-CoV-2 being emitted in one space and transferring throughout the building to infect everyone throughout the entire facility. That may not be occurring. It may be remaining in the original space. But of course, that leads to some other interesting um, operational scenarios that we need to be aware of that I'll talk about. But as well, on March 23rd of 2021, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention updated their ventilation frequently asked questions website. And one of those questions was, can COVID-19 be transmitted through HVAC ventilation systems? And they basically reinforced what others had said up to that point. And that was simply that while air flows within a particular space may help spread disease among people in that space, there's no definitive evidence to date that viable virus has been transmitted through HVAC systems to result in disease transmission to people in other spaces served by the same system. So that leads to the question, what can we do? And that is what I will talk about in the next few slides. One of the things we can do is treat the issues of concern in the space. If that's where they are originating, and that is where we are being told they appear to be remaining, then we most certainly need to treat them in the space. And we can do that by various measures. On the far left-hand side, you see in-space, upper room, UVGI lights mounted close to the ceiling. We don't want the light shining on people, so we direct the light source upward, and we hope that we have enough air movement, our air exchange rates in the space, to completely change that air through that light source many times per hour, and the UVC interaction with the contaminants in the air can help to mitigate or remediate some of those contaminants from the air within the space. Very simple concept. In the middle, we see in-space portable HEPA air filtration machines. We wheel them into the room, we turn them on. They typically are equipped with a HEPA grade, 99.97% efficient filter. We allow the air to circulate and exchange in the space maybe four to six times per hour. And that's one way that we can effectively help to scrub contaminants from the air in the space as well. And on the far right hand side, what I'll be talking about is needlepoint bipolar ionization technology. The difference between it and what you see on the, the other two uh, devices on the left-hand side is that it can actually be installed in the HVAC system. And from there, it's capable of reaching out into the space and treating the space as we are being told we may need to do. But first, let's talk about what is ionization in general? Ionization is simply uh, the imparting of an electrical potential to the atoms and molecules in the air, in the air around us, in the air that we're breathing. The air you're breathing right now is most certainly ionized. The first breath that you took when you entered this world and the last breath that you take when you leave this world most certainly will be ionized. Ions which are basically atoms and molecules in the air with an electrical potential. They are either positively or negatively charged, no neutrals, neutrals can't do any good, are imparted to the atmosphere through nature outdoors in various uh, naturally occurring phenomena. For example, let's take a lightning strike. You can imagine the uh, ability of that high voltage lightning strike potential to ionize or to impart an electrical charge to the atoms and molecules in the air that surround it. And when you stop and realize that there are literally thousands of lightning uh, uh, thunderstorms across the face of the earth every day, and literally hundreds of lightning strikes every second all across the earth, you can imagine the potential that that creates to highly ionize the air outdoors. As well, on the left-hand side, you can see a picture of me at a waterfall in North Carolina where I live reading ions with a handheld ion counter. Believe it or not, when you take a drop of water, and I want you to think waterfalls, I want you to think rivers and oceans and streams and mist and fog and rain, when you take a water droplet and you break it apart, it actually will impart ionization to the air that surrounds it. It's, it's an interesting phenomenon, it's something called the Leonard effect, L-E-N-A-R-D, Google it. We aren't really sure why, it, we just know it does. And in fact, you see me at a waterfall with a handheld ion counter reading an ion concentration there of around 55,000 negative ions per cubic centimeter, which is a very small volume of air. Now, where the air is the most highly ionized is outdoors where nature imparts ions to the air and where the air is considered to be the cleanest. 
And one of the reasons that nature ionizes the air is simply because these ions have the ability to interact with certain pollutants and contaminants in the air to mitigate them and to remediate them, to help eliminate them. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. The problem is simply this, where the ion concentrations are the highest outdoors and the air is the cleanest, that's great. But what happens is as that clean air works its way inland into more polluted environments, think urban environments, think inner cities, the ions are depleted, they're diminished, they're eliminated as they work on those contaminants. So that when you get into an inner city, where I was reading 55,000 ions per cubic centimeter at that waterfall, I might read 1,500 ions per cubic centimeter outside the building. And then when I come inside a building where it's even more highly polluted than it is immediately outdoors, I may read ion concentrations as low as 1 to 200 to 300 to 500 ions per cubic centimeter, considerably depreciated from Im immediately outside the building and orders of magnitude less than I might read outdoors where the air is the cleanest, where they're created by nature. So what we do with ionization, bipolar ionization, more specifically needlepoint bipolar ionization, is simply impart an artificial charge of ionization to the atoms and molecules in the indoor air that pass through the device to bring the concentrations of ions indoors to a level that is more consistent with the concentrations of ions outdoors where the air is the cleanest. I want to give the indoor air a fighting chance at helping to remediate the pollutants of concern there just like it does outdoors. And it is that simple. That is all we are doing with ionization. Now, there are many ways you can create ions artificially. We do it via what's called needlepoint ionization. And I draw your attention, if you will, for a minute to this lower slide in the middle. And you'll notice you see two emitters on the side of this little blue device that I'll come back to in a minute. Now, this is the ionization device itself. And we have several different makes and models that, that I'll talk a little bit more about when I get to the end of the presentation. But just so you can get a visual on this, this is a, about half the size of a, 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 a typical building brick. OK, about half that size. And it's a blue plastic box with electronics inside of it. But on the top of that box, we have two emitters. One emits positive, a positive charge potential. The other emits a negative charge potential so that I am positively and negatively ionizing the air, the molecules and atoms in the air that cross over that device. And we do it via needle points. If you'll notice these two little bushy uh, end assemblies that are on top of the emitter probes themselves. These are actually carbon fiber needle tips, needle points. They look like a paintbrush. They're very soft, very pliable, if you will, but they're actually made out of carbon fiber. And carbon fiber is the same material that we build airline fuselages out of, right? It's very durable, very robust, very corrosion resistant, very, very electric electrically conductive, and that's one of the keys. But the point is simply there that the, that the needles can impart a high charge of ionization to the airstream, and we can do it at a very low energy input. And because of that, this product has been validated to Underwriters Laboratory UL Standard 2998 for what they call zero ozone emissions, and that is very important and it's what differentiates our technology the way we do it with needle tips versus the other bipolar ionization technologies versus many other advanced IEQ technologies not only ionization itself but some of the UVC lights and some of the dry hydrogen peroxide and um, catalytic oxidation technologies and polarized media filtration a lot of other products out there may have a potential to produce ozone because of the energy input. Now, ASHRAE and the CDC both specifically say that if you are going to apply an IEQ technology indoors that is electrically powered, it should, and ASHRAE says it must comply with that UL2998 validated standard for zero ozone emissions. What we do is we take all of our products, we send them to UL, they put them in an ozone test chamber, they put an ozone um, testing device about two inches off the tips of the needles, and they turn it on and they run it for a considerable amount of time. And over that amount of time, as long as it does not produce any more than five parts per billion in ozone, it is then validated to that UL 
2998 standard for zero ozone emissions. That is very important to understand. You want to make sure any product that you're going to apply indoors that is an IEQ technology that is electrically powered has been validated to that standard if, number one, you want to be compliant with what, with what the CDC says you should do, and as well if you want to be compliant with ASHRAE standard 62.1 which in section 5.7.1 specifically requires that any products like that be validated to that standard. We most certainly are. All of our products are validated to that important standard, and I wanted to make sure you knew that up front. Part of the reason we do that is simply because of the needle points, the carbon fiber needles that we use to emit ionization to the air. Another key factor is simply we keep it clean. Anytime something gets dirty, the potential is there for it to emit, number one, not at the highest concentration that it was rated for originally, and as well, perhaps produce some type of a byproduct. You'll notice in the middle of these two needle tips, there's something here that this little blue post that sticks up. It's kind of hard to, to see, but there's actually a, looks like a windmill. There's two arms that reach off on either side of this blue device, and this is designed to be able to be programmed to spin every so often, every day, every three days, every week, whatever it is you wanna put in as what we call an auto cleaning program. And what happens is this windmill device will turn a number of times and it will actually hit those needle tips and dust them off. And it is auto cleaning. So the product will stay clean. It will emit its uh, maximum ion concentrations at all times because we keep it clean as well. We will not create byproducts such as ozone by the product itself getting dirty. So we maintain efficacy from a standpoint of, of safety and, uh, and efficiency. Um, the product itself is auto cleaning. There are also no replacement parts whatsoever on this product. You install it, you wire it, plug it in, uh, whatever you wanna do, it's rated for 24, 110, 208, 230 volts, very, very small amp draw. Uh, it's electronics, so typically we're looking at less than 15 watts of energy consumption on any one of our devices. I think the device I show here is, is four or five or six watts of energy consumption. So at the end of the day, once you put it in, turn it on, shut the door and walk away, your life cycle cost is basically your first installed cost. Very little energy consumption, no maintenance, no replacement parts, that's it. So that's another key differentiator, if you will, with regards to needle point bipolar ionization and almost any other ionization technology or air cleaning product for that matter. Now, I wanna talk about one of the most profound benefits of this product. If someone said to me, you know, you've got to just, you've got, you got two minutes to tell me the one thing about this product that just will knock my socks off, this is probably it. I mentioned to you that we are imparting a charge and energy potential to the atoms and molecules in the air that cross over the device and go out through the ductwork through the registers and grills into the space and mix with the particles. A positive and a negative energy potential. No neutrals, we get rid of them. Everything is positively or negatively energized. Now for a minute, I want you to think of a magnet. Magnets have polarity. Magnets can have a positive or a negative polarity. And what happens when I bring a positive and a negative magnet in close proximity to one another? Clink. They come together. They are attracted to one another. They are what they do. What I call a glom. They agglomerate to one another. They become bigger. I could have a hundred positively charged magnets in one hand and a hundred negatively charged magnets in the other, and I could throw them out onto a great big table. And in a second or two, they would be compelled to combine to one another through um, through the through the fact that the positives and the negatives are attracted and those 200 individual magnets become one great big magnet that's much easier for me to pick up and to move. Well, in similar form, the atoms and molecules that I have ionized with that energy potential, either positive or negative, go out in the space and they mix with all the particles in the air based on the airflow and the air movement in the space. Particles have a charge as well. They can be positive, they can be negative, they can be neutral. I can make the neutrals charged one way or the other with the ionization, and then I allow the negative ions to come in contact with the positively charged particles. I allow the negative ions to come in charge with the, I think I just said it backwards, but you know what I'm getting at. The positive and negative ions can agglomerate with the positive and negative 
negatively charged particles in the space and they can adhere, they can agglomerate, they can become bigger. And because I have made them bigger, they are now easier to influence with air motion. And because I can influence them with air motion, I can get them back to the HVAC system. And because I can get them back to the HVAC system, I can get them to the filter. And because I can get them to the filter and they are bigger, it is easier for the filter to extract them from the air and the ventilation and filtration system become more effective at doing what it is they're supposed to do. Think for a minute, if you will, of a sailboat sitting in the middle of the ocean. The mast is up, the sail is down. A gale force wind can come along and all it will do is rock that sailboat back and forth. There's just enough, not enough surface area exposed to that wind for that wind to be able to efficiently propel it. But what happens the second I put the sail up? A very gentle breeze can come along and it can quite effectively and efficiently propel that sailboat across the water. We expose more surface area to the air, the air becomes more efficient, more effective at moving it. We do the same thing with particles. We agglomerate them one to the other, we make them bigger, we open their sail, and we make them easier to influence with traditional air motion. And again, because of that, I can get them out of the space. But that's not all we can do because I've imparted an energy potential to those atoms and molecules that are in the air. I have the ability to be able to interact with certain pollutants, contaminants of concern. Certain viruses can be inactivated. Certain pathogens, think mold, think bacteria, think fungi, can be killed because of that energy potential to interact on the surfaces of those various contaminants. And we most certainly have tested time and time again on various viruses and pathogens of concern. We've tested in a Petri dish. We've tested in a little bit larger chamber, a BSL-3, maybe three foot by three foot by three foot chamber. And we have tested time and time again as well in one of the largest BSL-3 laboratory testing chambers that we know of in the world, which is 20 foot long, eight foot wide, and eight foot high. And we've mocked that up to represent for example, the interior of an office and an airline fuselage. And we have found that our technology in those various environments, in those various BSL-3 testing chambers, have efficacy to be able to inactivate SARS-CoV-2, for example, both in the air and on surfaces based on the ion concentrations that were provided to the chamber and based on the amount of time in the chamber as well. We have tested on SARS-CoV-2, we have tested on staph and E. coli and MRSA and influenza A and B, RSV, which causes bronchitis. We've tested on Legionella. We've tested on, uh, we're testing right now on the Delta variant and on MS2 and an array of other pathogenic issues of concern in the space. And we have proven efficacy with this technology in laboratory environments to be able to inactivate if it's a virus or kill if it's a pathogen. Now, a lot of people say, real world testing, real world testing. I wanna see testing like this in a school. You, you just can't do that, right? This is a, 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 a most of these, SARS-CoV-2 is a deadly virus. It has to be tested in what's called a BSL-3 uh, laboratory test chamber, which is where you test the deadly stuff. It needs to be tested under strict testing protocol by a staff, a laboratory staff that is, um, uh, efficient and effective at being able to do so without causing any damage or concern for themselves. So this is third-party testing that was done in a facility. And again, one of those facilities had one of the largest BSL-3 testing chamber environments in the world. And with a novel virus such as SARS-CoV-2 being new, we have done as much testing as anyone else has done on this virus from a standpoint of IEQ. And we've done it in as much of a realistic environment as humanly possible with regards to trying to give you something that can be replicated in the field should you wish to carry it over into that environment as well. We have been installed in an array of facilities in the past, some 250,000 installations prior to SARS-CoV-2. You see some notable names here. Um, I can't imagine what the count is now over the last 18 months. Um, we've, we've been drinking from a fire hose on this product because of what, what it can do. Uh, I deal with the healthcare vertical market. These are just some of the fine institutions that we are working with from a perspective of healthcare owners. Many of these I've been involved in myself directly, either prior to coming on board with, with uh, GPS as a rep in the field, or now the last 14 months actually working for the factory myself in a position of uh, covering the healthcare vertical market. This product has been scaled 
to be both fittable and affordable in more traditional environments. This in the past was what we might consider clean room technology, right? How do you make a clean room clean? You know, clean rooms don't have 18 to 20 million particles per cubic foot. They may have three or four or five particles per cubic foot. How do you make a clean room clean? And I'm talking semiconductor clean rooms, pharmacy clean rooms, food processing, healthcare clean rooms. Well, you do a couple of things. Number one, you typically increase the air exchanges. And in those environments, you may see 100 to 200 air changes per hour. You typically will increase the level of filtration in those environments. You'll typically see HEPA or ULPA filters that are well above 99.99% efficient. And then, in many of those environments, they will add ionization to the air to help electrostatically agglomerate the particles in the air, make them bigger, make them more movable so they can get them out of the space quicker and get them back to filters where the filters can be more effective at extracting them. What we've done with this technology is just basically take clean room technology and we've scaled it so that it now can be applied in your home in your office, in your school, in your hospital, in your restaurant, in your church, really in any environment with an HVAC system that moves air. You see on the right-hand side of this drawing in the middle, a couple of examples, this is a portable air scrubber or HEPA machine. We can outfit our product to that. The device can be wheeled into the room. You then have air circulation. You then have ionization and you have a 99.97% efficient filter. It's probably one of, if not the best air cleaning device on the face of the earth. But from there, we have product based on the system and where you want to put it that can be mounted in the ductwork or we can go back through the ductwork and mount it in the HVAC system itself, such as perhaps a furnace or a water source heat pump or a fan coil or a rooftop or an air handling unit. We can mount them in window units through the wall, PTACs. We can mount them in variable refrigerant volume type units and HVAC air conditioning mini splits. We pretty much got a product that will fit any application within a building that's moving air. And I have yet to have a building brought to me where we can't outfit it in one way, shape or form to create ionization either in the system or, or in the space itself. Now, I'm gonna talk application for just a couple of seconds because we probably have a few engineers on the line that are interested in, in, in um, you know, getting ions to the space and what that actually means. What, what we have found is that ions that have been created artificially by this technology have a half-life of about 60 six zero seconds. That means from when I make it to when it's been complete, completely depreciated is about 60 seconds. And there are some things that can deplete it before that. All right. So I want you to think for a minute, I have a positively and negatively charged ion. What happens if I touch one to the other? Well, it could deplete, right? It could depreciate the charge. What happens if it comes in contact with an oppositely charged surface of some type? It could be depleted. What happens if it comes in contact with a contaminant? whether it be dust or a pathogen or a virus of some type, it could be depleted in doing what it is it does. As it agglomerates, it will be depleted and re-energized uh, as more ionization comes on. The key is I'm providing ionization to the space on a continuous basis. As long as I have the ion device turned on and I have airflow and I have ions in the space, I am replenishing any that may have been depleted. And we make so many that in a traditional HVAC system, they aren't depleted that considerably before they get to the space and have a chance to work on the contaminants in the space. But they do have about a 60 second lifespan. And we have found that it's desirable to deliver those to the space somewhere between 20 and 30 seconds. So I make it and I've got up to say 20 or 30 seconds to get them out into the space. And then I have another 30 to 40 seconds for them to work in the space individually with regards to what's ever left. And in the past, we used to have some rules of thumb that we would use. And we would say, based on the velocity of the system and the maximum length of duct work, this is about how quick ions get to the space. And you can see they get there pretty darn quick. You know, once you make an ion and you get in a system that's moving air between 1,000 and 2,500 feet per minute in the duct work, they're there in a jiffy. It's usually not an issue of concern, but every now and then it was. So what we did was we came up with a very simple ion calculator for engineers. It's a very simple spreadsheet. It's four pages and one of the pages is simply the instructions that tell you how to use it. And the other three pages allow you to make some very simplistic calculations that will ensure you're getting ions delivered to the space from where you made them 
to where you want them to be in the amount of time that we recommend. So I'll give you a couple examples of how this might work. The second screen is simply a velocity calculator. You enter the CFM. You enter either the height and the width, if it's a rectangular duct, or the round dimension of the duct, should it be a round. And it then will come up with the velocity of air through that piece of ductwork. You then take this and it will tell you green, anything that falls within a green shade means that you're within the velocity limits that we recommend for the product. If it turns uh, orange or red, it just means, hey, take caution here. Look at what you're doing and, and analyze it in a little bit more detail, if you will, please. You then take this velocity number and you walk into one of the last two uh, uh, functions in the spreadsheet it will, uh, that are there. So for example, if it's a, a constant volume system, I will enter the velocity in feet per minute. I will enter the number of feet of ductwork that I have in my system. I have to manually measure that, of course. And it then will run the calculations for me and tell me how quickly I am getting those ions to the space. And in this particular example, at 800 feet per minute, which is kind of low for a traditional duct system, and 250 feet of duct, I'm there in 19 seconds, I'm good to go. Had this been 20, it still would have been a green cell. Had it been 21, it would have turned orange. Had it been 40 or 50, it would have turned red. So you'll know that you want to analyze it if it isn't within the realm of what we consider acceptable. But in this case, it is. And for example, if this were 1,600 feet per minute, this time would have been cut in half. It'd be there in eight seconds. Boom. No problem with that at all. Now, should you be running a VAV system where you have a main trunk duct, and then you have a VAV box that may turn down in airflow, and then you have an additional length of duct after the VAV box, this calculator simply allows you to go in and analyze both of those trunk duct runs with the minimum turn down on the VAV box considered as well. As I mentioned, it's important to understand if I'm not getting air to the space, if I'm not mixing air and providing air to the space, I'm not ionizing it. So it's important that we don't turn the airflow down too low and we don't limit the, the, the ability of those ions to get from the box to the space. So again, in this particular example, all the outputs are in green. I'm good to go, no problem. This is a great design. And this is just um, a way that we help engineers, uh, I guess I would say pinpoint in a little bit more detail, the design and application of the system. And from there, we're, we're, we help them all the time. This is kind of my poor man's rendition of the uh, Pixar video that you saw in the beginning of the presentation, but I want to go over this one more time just to make a couple of points. On the left-hand side, I show a space, and there's some issues of concern in that space. We'll come back to that in a minute. And what I am typically doing is I am taking air from the space. I am bringing it through the HVAC system. I'm attempting to filter it and to clean it. I'm probably heating it and cooling it, humidifying it, dehumidifying it. I may have some type of an advanced IEQ technology installed to treat it even further. And then I am providing that air back to the space having been treated hopefully better than when it left the space itself. And in the space, I have all kinds of issues of concern. There may be viruses. There may be various volatile organic compounds or chemicals in the air. There may be pathogens, bacteria, mold, fungus, et cetera. And in addition to that, smoke and odors and dust and other particulates, right? So what I'm doing with needle point bipolar ionization located in the HVAC system, I am imparting that charge of energy, that negative and positive energy potential to the atoms and molecules in the air that cross through the ionization field. And I am allowing them to go out through the ductwork, through the registers and grills, into the space, and to begin mixing with the various issues of concern in the space itself. So I may begin inactivating viruses on surfaces and in the air. I may be attacking various odors. I may be killing certain pathogens, but for certain I'm agglomerating those along with everything else in the air to help clean the sunbeam. And what it is I do is get the stuff out of the space more effectively and back to the ventilation and filtration system where it can be more effective at extracting the issues of concern from the space that we are being told there's a lack of evidence leaving the space. It appears that they are originating in the space, they may be remaining in the space, and if that is the issue, the guidance has said we need to treat the space itself if we wanna be effective at helping to do a real good job of clearing that sunbeam. And at the end of the day, this most certainly is a technology that can help do that. And I'll leave you with one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite past ASHRAE presidents, Tim Wentz. If any of you are, are uh, a little bit older and have been ASHRAE members for a while, you may remember Tim. 
he was one of my favorite ASHRAE presidents. If you can have one, he, he was it. Real uh, down to earth, practical engineers kind of engineer. And he said at that time, a statement that was as applicable then as it is now, as it will be a hundred years from now. And that is simply that the greatest challenge we face today is the failure to adapt to change. And with that, I will thank you and uh, turn it back over to Dean and, and to you for questions and comments. All right, thanks, Dave. Certainly. Uh, yeah, we do have a few questions here. Um, the first, can water features add ions in a building? It could. Uh, yeah, through, through the Leonard effect, if you've got a water feature such as a waterfall or a sprinkler or something of that nature that's atomizing the air, breaking down the water droplets themselves, which I'm sure would happen, it would be similar to what you saw in that waterfall picture. You would you would ionize the air. Uh, you could most certainly prove that by taking a handheld ion counter like I showed in one of those first slides, turning it on and walking up and counting both the positive and negative ions that have been emitted to the air and then just backing off. You know, go in the next room or go outside or go somewhere else where away from that water feature and you would, my guess would be, you most certainly would see lower levels there. It's really cool stuff. It's a lot of fun. I, ta I take my ion counter with me when I on vacation and if I go up to the top of my I used to live in Colorado and I used to a lot of I'll, I'll say mountain climbing but you know I was hiking up you know just trails not no big deal but I'd get up to elevations say 12,000 feet and I would count 25,000 ions per cubic centimeter at those higher elevations where the air is very 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 clean and then I would come home into downtown Denver where I lived and I'd go out on the patio that same day and I'd count ion concentrations there of maybe 400 ions per cubic centimeter. So considerable degradation or depreciation in ion counts from the top of a mountain to my urban uh, uh, apartment building in, in dirty downtown Denver. And then I was covering the healthcare vertical market there. I'd take it into a hospital, for example, into perhaps the uh, uh, admittance area or the lobby. It's nothing to see ion concentrations as low as 100 to 200 ions per cubic centimeter inside an environment like that, which is even dirtier than outside and most certainly uh, less clean than it would be at the top of the mountain. It's a lot of fun. Nice. All right, uh, next question. When installing this technology in existing duct systems, does it make sense to clean the ductwork prior to installation? As far as getting the dust and, and uh, lint and du and mold and anything else that might be in there from a perspective of biological contaminants, I, I, I think that always makes sense. You don't have to, but um, I would say that if it's caked with dust, it's just another turbulent source for the ions on the outer shell of the airflow moving down the duct to come in contact with, which may create additional depletion. So there may be some benefit from that perspective, but I'm I'm a, a big fan of if you've got a dirty duct system, clean it up. You know, uh, uh, residue inside duct systems, particularly if it if it has a tendency to get wet and stay wet, which it may do in certain HVAC systems based on the relative humidity of the air, most certainly can grow my, microbial contamination. So it's something to to be aware of. Okay. All right. Great. Um, there's a quick question here about placement uh, before or after the chilled water coil. Good question. So we would like to see it, if it's going to be installed on the HVAC system coil within the air handling unit, let's say, we would wanna see it upstream of the cooling coil. Now, a couple of things, that would make it, that would make it downstream of the MERV-8 pre-filter typically. It would be upstream of the cooling coil. The reason we like it there is that, as I mentioned, we can kill certain pathogens. We can remediate issues with microbial growth, mold and mildew, on the cooling coil. Now, you could do the same thing with the UV light on the leaving side, but understand that depending on how deep the coil is and how tight the fins are spaced, I've seen a lot of hospital applications with UV lights on deep cooling coils where the light couldn't reflect or refract deep enough in the coil to keep it completely clean. And if you cut that coil in half, and I've got pictures, you'll have a couple of rows on the leaving air side that are clean because the UV light got back in that far. You'll have three or four rows of, 
of coil surface that has mold growth. And then on the entering air side, the surface temperature is too high, there's no condensation, it stays clean as well. So you look at that coil on both ends and you go, it's clean. Perfect, the UV lights are working, but when you cut it in half, you've got a couple of rows inside with mold growth. Our technology installs on the entering air side of the coil. The ions flush the coil and keep the coil clean from the back to the front. So you won't have that microbial growth in a cooling coil. As well, you will get some ions downstream of the cooling coil, but it's important to understand that you've not only come in contact with the metal surface, but you've also remediated contaminants within that coil. You will have less ions leaving than entered, perhaps considerably. So the other issue in a hospital is job is simply you will, then will usually have a final filter that those ions may come in contact with. And filters, regardless of the MERV rating, are so turbulent they will annihilate ions. That's really the only thing we have to watch for in an HVAC system. We don't want to be upstream of any filter whatsoever. So if you have a final filter, ions are done. If you don't, ions will get into the space. But if you want to maximize the concentration of ions in the space itself, it's always best to get the device as close to the space as you can. And I move to the right-hand side of this picture where I've installed them either in a portable unit or in the ductwork or perhaps in a fan in an HVAC system with no final filter that's relatively close to the space. That is the way to maximize ions in the space to make sure that we get maximum concentrations that can do you know, their, their best at, at helping to remediate the issues of concern in the space where the contaminants originate and, and appear to be remaining. Does, does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, I think it does. Great. Well. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, next question here, how do we get the calculator? Um, everyone that attended here today will get uh, an email later today from myself and uh, that will have a few items within it. Um, it'll have uh, a link to the website, a link to our um, the Buckley Associates YouTube channel, which will have a video copy of this presentation, and then it'll also have this calculator as part of it as well. And I believe this calculator is also available on the website. Is that correct, Dave? I, I'm not sure about that, to be honest with you. Larry? Okay. I don't know if you're on and can speak, but it may be. It's not a highly guarded secret. It's, it's just nice. It's just a very nice, convenient item to be. I used to do it manually all the time, and yeah. it just, yeah. I can do this in three seconds, right. and it took me 30 before. Right. So, you know. Yeah, that, that calculator is not on the website yet, but I, I think it will be on there within the next month or two. Okay. Okay. Well, anyways, everyone that attended today uh, will get a copy of it wonderful yeah um another question here it is uh, uh it's a few questions but they're they're all kind of um getting at the same thing here uh are positive and negative ions generated at the same time uh if so wouldn't they all group together and uh do the agglomerated particles fall out of the air Okay, that's 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 a couple of great points. Let's start with the first question, uh, which was, um, well, give me the first one again. I'm, I'm thinking, of, <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking of all yeah. of them. I've got them. I've got are, them agglomerated in my mind. <laughs> are the positive particles generated at the same time? Okay, so depending on the device, we have a majority of our products are 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 converted from AC to DC voltage. All DC voltage devices have both a positive and a negative emitter on the same device. So at the same time, it is generating both positive and negative ionization. One of our other devices, and the only one that is on AC current, is the device that stall installs typically on larger cooling coils, as I mentioned, upstream of the cooling coil to flush it. It's a bar that we sized for the entire width of the cooling coil, we monitor at the top of the cooling coil and we disperse ions down over the inlet face of that cooling coil so that the air picks the ions up and moves them through the coil. There are just so many emitter points on there, or emitter tips, needle tips, if you will, that we cannot put a little cleaning device on every one. 
as well, it's just more efficient for us to, to, to provide the ionization in alternating current. So the way this device works is on a 60 second sine wave and every one sixtieth of a second, it is emitting positive ions and every one sixtieth of a second, it is emitting negative ions. So it's back and forth, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, 60 times a second. Now, the beauty of that is simply that because we are emitting oppositely charged ions to the air, when it is when it's in, when it's emitting positive ions, any negatively charged particles that may have adhered to the tips themselves will be somewhat repelled. And oppositely, when it's making negative ions, any positively ch charged particulate that may have adhered to the tips will be repelled. So it's almost, but not quite auto cleaning. We do recommend on that product you go in every so often, maybe with every filter change and you could take something as simple as a, a nylon baby bottle brush and just brush those tips off real quick just to make sure that the device itself is clean. Um, but other than that, the beauty of the DC voltage and emitting both ions at the same time is that um, we can do it with two tips and we can put the windmill in the middle that spins to keep those tips clean. All right. Was, was the, I hope that answered it. Uh, I, I think it did pretty well. There was a second part there, and it was um, uh, do the agglomerated particles fall out of the air? Oh, it's, it's possible that could happen. So what will happen is, again, you've got the fine and ultra fines that, for the most part, you know, uh, effectively don't leave the space. They stay there for an extended period of time. So once we ionize that air, and it, it's not going to happen immediately, we don't, we don't turn the device on, provide ions to the space, and all of a sudden everything's agglomerated immediately and the space is clear. It takes time because some of those particles are very, very, very small. So over a few hours, perhaps a few days, agglomeration will occur in the space and the very, very, very small particles will become bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where a couple of things can happen. Number one, they can be influenced with air motion or if you've got some spots in the space that aren't ventilated correctly and you're not getting the air movement that you should have, perhaps those particles can become large enough that they will fall out of suspension based on gravitational influences and then they'll become dust on the floor or on the surface or somewhere in the environment itself. Now, two things happen as a net result of the ionization and the ability to get the small stuff out of the space. Number one, filters become dirtier. They just do. They're more effective. They're more actually more efficient. The particles are bigger and easier to extract, but also particles that weren't leaving before leave and they leave quicker. So filters can become dirtier quicker as well. Surfaces may become a little more dusty than they were in the past. But the beauty of that is now I can take care of those through housekeeping or maintenance. I no longer am the filter. I, my lungs are no longer the filter walking through that space, breathing that stuff. And that's the beauty of this technology. We clean the sunbeam. Great. Um, one more here. Uh, your presentation highlights the NPBI as a physical process likened to magnetism. Since it actually creates reactive chemicals, can you discuss the chemical byproducts that are generated through reactions with the chemicals present in the room atmosphere? A couple of things that are important to understand is number one, it is a physical process, most certainly. We are we are physically imparting a charge of ionization to the atoms and molecules in the air, and we are doing it at a very low ionization potential. We operate at 12 electron volts, no more, no less. That's one of the main reasons that we are able to qualify for UL2998 zero ozone production. It's because we are a low ion energy potential emitting source that does not necessarily react with the air to create additional or unintentional byproducts. The testing we have done through Intertex and others has not detected levels of concern with regards to byproducts or chemistry in the air. And we have testing that we can we can show you that will back that up as well. So from a standpoint of, of uh, a process such as uh, dry hydrogen peroxide or photocatalytic oxidation where they're taking a UV bulb and a, a metal substrate that is typically titanium dioxide and they're chemically interacting one to the other and creating a chemical reaction in the air. That's not how we work. 
All right, awesome. Uh, and actually, there is there is a, a few more here. Um, will uh, NPBI clean the duct? So, so clean is a relative term. Will it sweep it out? Will it remove residual uh, microbial growth that's perhaps uh, been inactivated or killed? Will it, um, it will it remove uh, dust from the surface? No. What it will do in the duct is simply help remediate any potential microbial growth. So for example, should you have mold growth on a cooling coil, as an example, it will remediate it, it will limit it, it will create a, a situation where the mold cannot proliferate and grow. If you have a coil that has a, a living uh, microbial contaminant on it and you install NPBI, while it may uh, kill the living microbial contaminant, it will not remove the residue. So clean is a relative term. It will it will remediate and mitigate and eliminate microbial growth, but it won't actually clean something that's dirty. It may inactivate or kill it if it's a living uh, organism or a virus of some type, but it won't physically remove it. I hope that answers it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think it does. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and then is there a price sheet available for the different options? I'll, I'll probably answer that one. Um, I would say uh, for pricing, uh, reach out to your Buckley representative and they can help you with pricing. But you know, from, a, from a design and uh, an application standpoint, really what we price is gonna be dependent on your project and, and where we think the best locations would be to locate the devices. And that's gonna drive what options and, and what devices we use within the system. Um, so that would really be something that we wanna look at on a case by case and a, and a project basis. And um, you know we would really wanna engineer the system and, and apply it properly rather than just handing over a price sheet. Wonderful, good and good for you. So if you don't know, um, whoever, you know, the, the person who asked that question, if you don't know who your Buckley representative is, uh, you can reach out to myself um my uh my email and phone number are right there and i'll be sending out a follow-up email this afternoon as well so feel free to respond to that all right uh we've gone a little past one o'clock here those were all the questions they were they were great, great questions, great so questions. For, love it for, yeah asking them and and thank you for staying engaged and and uh, spending your lunch hour with us this afternoon and thanks to Dave and GPS for helping us to, to put this on and, and um, you know giving a great presentation. I enjoyed it thank you so much hope we can do it again. Absolutely next week right? Yes we can <laughs> as a matter of fact <laughs> I look forward to it. Yeah all right great I hope everyone has a great afternoon thanks again Dave. Thanks Dean thanks Larry thanks everyone.